So, do you want to know the 5 things that can take your architecture images to the next level? You've come to the right place, because in this video I'm gonna show you all the essential stuff to look for while visualizing your projects. Hey guys, O'Graphics in here. My name is Oliver, and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. I post new videos weekly all about architecture visualization and representation. I'm also on Instagram at o.graphics, so go follow me there so you don't miss any new updates. Alright, so I've been wanting to make this video for a while now. This list is a combination of the things I always go over when creating my own architecture images. Plus, this is also some common mistakes I often see students making when trying to visualize their projects. Now, keep in mind that this is my own opinion, and it is what I use during my post-productions. Of course, for other people, this can vary a lot. And also, in the world of architecture visualization, we are all aiming for a final product. There are several ways you can get there. Usually, you have a 3D software for modeling, then you use a render engine to create a base image, and eventually we'll end up in Photoshop to post-product the image. My workflow consists in spending much more time over Photoshop than on the actual render engine like V-Ray, for example. So this 5-point list will help you no matter what type of software and workflow you use. And to be honest, if you give these 5 items a closer attention while visualizing your images, you've got a pretty high chance of having an amazing result at the end. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Number 1. Framing So, the way you frame your images can really make or break your post-production. If you don't frame it properly, it won't actually matter how good your render is and how many effects you add in Photoshop. I've said it many times already, but you have to think as if this was an actual painting or drawing. We are trying to present the actual project in such a way that is aesthetic pleasing. Plus, the correct framing should help you with what you're trying to tell with the image. For example, the better you choose the framing, the easier it will be to present your project to the professor and to the client. Because the image should talk for itself. Keep in mind that everything I say here counts for either exterior or interior scenes, alright? Focus on eye level images. Your building will be used by someone, and they will look at it from my level. I see a lot of people showcasing their designs mostly from above, usually first and second year students. I mean, there's no problem with having one or two shots to show a great aerial view. It helps you understand the context of which the architecture building is inserted. I like those as well, but one or two and that's it. Focus on how the building will be perceived from the street. Also, please always align verticals. I cannot stress this enough, align verticals. There's nothing uglier than those distorted looking images. Unless you were actually aiming for a distorted one, like those looking into the sky images, but that's an exception. It's just like a proper real-life architecture photo. 90 degrees verticals will help you have a better overall composition for sure. Now, if you're doing a frontal image, also make sure you've got the horizontals as flat as possible. It causes some strangeness if you have a facade render and the house looks like it's going downhill. I'm showing you these examples using SketchUp because once you're in Photoshop, there's no way to reposition the camera, so you gotta make it right on the 3D software. The verticals can be fixed over Photoshop, and also the canvas size, which we're going to talk later. Now, when deciding where to frame your project, consider those compositions fundamentals you learn in first year of architecture school. Rule of thirds, asymmetry and symmetry, balanced composition, and so on. This building is the School of Architecture of São Paulo University in Brazil, designed by Vila Nova Artigas. And if I were to frame it into an image, I would probably choose this scene here, not on the center, but on the edge, with the same space left to the side and top. This is an aesthetic preference, but it also dialogues a bit with the rule of thirds, and I feel that it takes good use of the canvas as well. Alright, that's a lot of things under the framing topic, but let's move on and talk about depth. A great image has a balanced composition, and that is not only in terms of screen elements, but also depth-wise. 
What I'm trying to say here is that the viewer can really dive in and feel the environment if the image has a foreground, middle and background working all together to create a sense of depth. For example, it can be a foreground with a tree, a plant, a person or even intentionally nothing. Then the middle ground will be your subject of focus, usually your design. Then a background to set the place and understanding of the location. Talking about depth leads me to the third item, which is story. Your architecture render has to express more than just what's going to be built. It has to tell a story, portray an atmosphere, a mood. These stories have to be subtle. It's not a comic book by any means, but for example, with the image that we did over the post-production course, in my opinion, shows a pretty good example of it. It shows this couple enjoying their weekend at this cabin, She's looking over the valley while he might be relaxing over the living room. The oven is turned on, cooking something as the smoke blows off with the wind. It's subtle, but it's there, got it? It would be a completely different mood if I had placed the people in other activities and or overcrowded the place. Usually cutouts will better help you represent these moods and stories, but that's not an obligation. An empty room can say a lot as well. Let me explain this one. The fact that it has only that one guy in the atrium and the image has a very low camera point emphasizes the amplitude and the greatness of this space. The image kind of transmits that breathtaking sensation you would have if you entered this room. The fourth item is canvas proportion. This one was mentioned already over the collage video but it is also a really important topic for architecture visualizations in general. We are tied on usually creating images on a landscape 16 by 9 ratio. It is our standard monitor proportion, so in order to maximize our screen space, we tend to use it. I even remember when I was an intern in a pretty big office here in my city, where all the renders were done in 16 by 9 no exception, so that they could fit in a PowerPoint to then be presented over a TV to the client. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense, but oftentimes, with exterior scenes especially, they get very cramped. The sky plays a major role in the composition, it lets the focus of the image breathe, and it balances out the canvas. What I'm trying to say here is to take advantage of the canvas proportions. Think where it's going to be displayed to set your image ratio. I really like squared images for my own personal projects, but I usually play according to the board. On the same topic, we can discuss overall proportions on the image. How much of your image will you use for each type of element? This thinking should come in while you're still choosing your scene. What type of shot would you like to do? It can be one that shows your building from far away and you have a much deeper understanding of the entourage. Or a close-up shot to focus on the entrance. So basically, each decision will set the mood and goal of your post-production. So we've checked framing, depth, story and canvas proportion. But there's still one major topic left and if we screw this up, it will ruin everything we did correctly. And that is... Colors. I know I owe you guys this video about color basics and color theory, and I'm working on it. But in the meantime, let me show you how you can use colors to improve your architecture visualizations. The first thing is the image color palette. Just like any other piece of art, clothing, interior design and so on, the image has to be appealing to our eyes. One way to do that is to follow some sort of color scheme. Just a quick note, the color scheme here is much more subtle than a collage or a 2D drawing. There are several websites that can provide you plenty of samples to give you ideas, but the best way to learn is to analyze references from professional archivists offices. I tend to avoid very saturated colors. Those colors usually make the image very aggressive to the eyes. Also, all the colors and cutouts and objects you insert should be chosen with intention. I really love to tweak people clothing colors to achieve a specific effect and make the image as a whole much more pleasing. Another thing that you can do is use color temperature to induce some moods. If you're in a colder environment, lower the color temperature, just like if you have a coastal building that should exhale fun, youth and energy, ramp it up. 
Now, this video talks about post-production images that have a bit of realism, but does not seek that ultra-realistic result. If you're someone that works focused on producing images for other architecture offices, great, you should of course push yourself to achieve extraordinary results. But if you're a practicing architect, the visualizing architecture is a part of your job, and not the only thing you do in a day, then you should optimize to achieve a great result without spending more time than you should. Awesome! These are the 5 items that will definitely help you make better images. But there's one last thing that I would like to mention, that is not a proper item I would say, but I feel that is important to highlight. Which is details and imperfections. If you want to get one step closer to realism, you should pay attention on how the real world is. Nothing is perfect, the floor isn't that uniform surface, just like the concrete isn't a regular even finish, there are cracks, stains and holes. If there's a tree around, usually there will be leaves on the floor, depending on the time of the year, and the plant of course, there will be scratches on the metal, there will be furniture misaligned and things over the table, got it? All the things mentioned in this video are the things that I look for with my images, things that I have to push myself into making it better each time. And with time, you will eventually get the hang of it. It's not a rule, it's a constant learning process. So I really want to know about you guys. What are the things you go after when visualizing architecture images? Did I miss anything really important? Let me know in the comments below. Share some knowledge with the others. This model from the Architecture School of Sao Paulo was provided by the website Exemplary Architectures. I'm going to leave the link in the video description. If you guys want some good 3D models to practice, you should definitely check it out. Also, I've got a course that teaches the workflow of architecture post-productions. The link will also be in the video description for those interested. The full PSD from this image will be over our Gumroad page, you can check it out in the video description as well. So I did this one quickly for this YouTube video to illustrate all the things mentioned and I really loved what came out of it. Now I bet after watching this video you can already spot the 5 points, right? Alright, thank you so much for watching, don't forget to like, subscribe and drop your questions below if you have any. Also, have you seen our last video about how to use Google Maps and Photoshop to present a urbanism project? Check it out here. Alright, that's it for me, see you in the next video, bye!